So uh, just uh, for those that are joining us for the first time or are new here, this is our weekly apologetics academy that we run every Saturday at 8 p.m. UK time, which translates as uh, 3 p.m. Eastern or uh, 2 p.m. Central or 12 noon Pacific. And we run these every Saturday, bring in different speakers um, representing a diversity of, of viewpoints across the theological and philosophical spectrum. Uh, last week we had with us uh, Aaron Rath, the atheist, to talk to us about his views on religion and faith. Uh, week before that we had Dr. Michael Behe, biochemist from Lehigh University, talking to us about the biochemical evidence for design. Um, next week uh, we have with us Dr. Michael Brown, who's um, a very well-known biblical scholar, who's written um, a lot of different um, books on different uh, topics and is a very well-known international speaker. And he's going to talk to us about uh, biblical prophecy, which is one of his areas of expertise, a particular messianic prophecy, and uh, demonstrating from the Jewish Hebrew scriptures that Jesus is, in fact, the Jewish Messiah. And um, then the following week, we have uh, Matt Dillahunty, who's a well-known atheist um, speaker, and who's going to talk to us about why he's an, an atheist. And uh, this evening, we're blessed to have with us uh, Cameron McAllister from Rabbi Zacharias International Ministries, uh, who is going to be giving to us a, a presentation on the argument from desire, which is a famous um, argument, which um, I, I think was first pioneered by C.S. Lewis. Um, in, um, it was a well-known 20th century Christian theologian. And um, the way this works, it, for those of you who are new or joining us for the first time, is we typically have our... Um, yes, speaker present to us um, to give us um, a taste of their viewpoint or perspective, and then we fuel the questions from the floor. And so there's a number of ways that you can participate as an audience member. Um, you are, um, by default, um, in the viewers section, there's two categories of participant. There's panelist and there's viewer. Most of you are currently in the viewer section. Um, if you are a viewer, then you can do a number of things. You can participate in the chat box, which you can access by clicking the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also um, uh, submit questions anonymously by hitting the Q&A button um, and submitting a question. You can also raise your hand. There's a raise your hand button um, on the bottom of your screen as well, which then will um, signal to me that you wish to be made live with the speaker and interact with them by engaging your webcam and or uh, microphone. And um, and you can interact with them, express disagreement, or ask clarifying questions, or um, or what have you, or make comments um, on their um, presentation. And or you can just sit and listen on anonymously. Um, you don't have to participate um, at all. Um, so uh, this evening, as I said, we have Cameron McAllister from RZIM. Uh, Cameron, do you want to just uh, briefly introduce yourself for those that um, maybe haven't come across your your work before? Certainly. So, as mentioned, I work with a Christian apologetics organization called Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. Obviously, I am, I am a Christian. I am a believer. I grew up as a missionary kid in Vienna, Austria. And so I spent the first 14 years of my life in Europe and moved to the States around 1999 and have been in Atlanta, Georgia ever since. This is the land where they say, y'all. I believe uh, Mark McGee is in the same sort of general area. That's right. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, you wanted to maybe kick us off. I don't know if you're using a PowerPoint. You are welcome to use one if you want to. Uh, there is a way to do it if you if you need to use PowerPoint, but otherwise, then you're good to go. Good to go? Yeah. All right. No worries, no PowerPoint, but... Okay. Go ahead. So I'll speak for about... What, 25 minutes or so. Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. and, open, okay. and then I'll open it for, for questions. Yeah. So we could go to, we'll go for, for a little yeah, while we, there. We, yeah, different different speakers speak for different durations. I normally say anywhere up to an hour. So anywhere less than an hour is, is fine for talk. Yeah, that's great. All right. I'll, I'll try to keep the, the talk relatively brief mm -hmm. because I'm interested in the questions. Sure. And we shall go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on the program. I really appreciate it. And also, let me commend everybody who's tuned in for doing so on a Saturday. I know that there's other things you could be doing. So I'm delighted that you're here and that you've tuned in. And whether you're a believer or not, 
I'm glad that you recognize the importance of the topic of Christianity and the existence of God. And I'm glad that you recognize that it is at least a legitimate question. So today, as, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk about the argument from desire. This has been around for a little while, but it's not always been as popular. And I think that's understandable from the onset. You usually it, don't want to bring desire into the conversation. At least many people would think that. It seems counterintuitive to bring desire into discussions of the existence or non-existence of God. After all, haven't many of the more illustrious atheists of the 20th century basically said that Christianity is a form of wishful thinking? The two perhaps most accomplished exponents of this view that Christianity is a species of wishful thinking would be Sigmund Freud, the Austrian psychologist, and then Ludwig Feuerbach. Now, both of these men argued that Christianity is essentially a form of, of wish fulfillment for many people. And they do so in quite sophisticated terms. And oftentimes you'll hear it, you'll hear it said in popular forums that Christianity is a crutch. People who want to hide from reality can do so in the, behind the walls of the church, and so on and so forth. And so these are some formidable objections. Nevertheless, I think the argument from desire is an important argument, and I think it's a helpful one. Now, let me say from the onset, and I'll try to repeat this throughout, just so that there aren't any misconceptions. I'm not being hugely ambitious with the argument from desire. I think it presents us with a powerful clue about God's existence. I don't think it constitutes a full-fledged proof of God. So I don't think that the argument from desire proves God's existence. I think it gives us a very powerful clue but an important clue, one that we can't just sweep under the rug and do away with. I think that would be dismissive. And so that said, another strength of the argument from desire is that it actually, it's an existential argument. It intersects with our day-to-day -day lives. Here's something that I found to be true as I've traveled around the United States and also as I've traveled around the world now talking about Christianity. Many people don't think that Christianity has anything to do with life. They think of Christianity like many Westerners do or like many modern people do, that Christianity is essentially something that's purely private and it doesn't really intersect with life in the real world. You might go to church, you might pray, but you do that on your own time. But then when you step out of the prayer meeting or out of the church or wherever it is you go, to, to explore spirituality, then you leave that behind and you go into the real world and you do your real day-to-day -day things. And so what you believe, your so-called deeper beliefs about God and spirituality, don't really have much to do with your day-to-day -day life. And a lot of the classical arguments for God's existence, the proofs, the five, whether it's Thomas Aquinas' five proofs or arguments from design, I think those arguments are very important and indeed very useful and very powerful, but they tend to be a little bit abstract and they tend to be intellectually compelling, but existentially they can sometimes leave a bit to be desired. And in our own day and age, people very much prize experience. And so this argument has the strength of being drawn directly from human experience. It really, it's drawn from our day-to-day -day lives. And so I think that gives it a unique resonance for many people. So it didn't begin its life as an argument. I keep talking about the argument from desire. It didn't start off as a formal argument. And as, already, as has already been mentioned, we can trace it back to a famous Christian thinker named C.S. Lewis. And the argument, the blueprint for the argument of desire, from desire, we find the blueprint for it in the book Mere Christianity, a very, famous, a very famous book that started off as a series of lectures for the BBC radio. But in the hope section of Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes a couple of provocative statements that provide the blueprint for the argument from desire. Let me give that to you. He says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for these desires exists. A baby feels hunger, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, 
Well, there is such a thing as water. Man feels sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. And here's the important part. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Let me read that again. If I find in myself a desire which nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. This is a very famous statement of Lewis's, and many people have really been provoked by it to deeper thought. But what Lewis is getting at is that there seems to be this insatiable, unquenchable desire in all human beings. It's the thing that drove Mick Jagger to sing that he can't get no satisfaction. But we also find it in some, some of our greatest poems, in some of our greatest songs, this long-standing notion that there's more to life. There's this more, more joy, more happiness, more fulfillment, more money, more sex, whatever it is. And this more somehow always eludes our grasp. We're never quite there. We've never quite got it, whatever it is. And in recent years, we have the testimony of some fairly successful people that success itself isn't it. Brad Pitt, for instance, has said, he's been on record as saying, I've experienced more success than most people would ever dream of. And I'm here to tell you that this isn't it. Jim Carrey has said the same thing. And these examples could be multiplied. So that's what Lewis is getting at here. There's this insatiable desire that all human beings who are honest with themselves experience. So again, let me remind you, as I talk about the formal expression of this argument, again, I don't think it's a proof for God's existence. I think it's a clue. But it's the philosopher Peter Kraft who has given a formal expression to C.S. Lewis's argument from desire. Peter Kraft will be familiar to some of you. He is a professor, a philosophy professor at Boston College and also at King's College in New York. And he wrote a book called The Handbook of Christian Apologetics. It's a very useful book. And he's, his formal expression of the argument from desire is in that book. I'm going to walk us through it. It's a syllogism. And I apologize if this is a little bit dry and a little bit technical. But we'll go through it and I'll I'll unpack it, but what I want you to bear in mind is that the most important part of Peter Kraft's argument is actually the first premise. I'll spend the most time unpacking the first premise, but I'll go through these and I'll try to repeat so that you can keep it fresh in your mind. But this is the argument from desire. This is where C.S. Lewis's blueprint now becomes a full-fledged argument. So Peter Kraft says, number one, Every natural, innate desire in us corresponds to some real object that can satisfy that desire. Now, again, this is the most important point that Peter Kraft is going to make. Let me repeat it. Every natural, innate desire in us corresponds to some real object that can satisfy that desire. Number two. But there exists in us a desire which nothing in time, nothing on earth, no creature can satisfy. There exists in us a desire which nothing in time, nothing on earth, and no creature can satisfy. And number three, therefore, there must exist something more than time, something more than just this earth and this world, and something more than creatures which can satisfy this desire. Remember I talked about that elusive more. There's that something more that keeps drawing us forward. What is it? If this is a natural and innate desire for this more, Peter Kraft argues, then there must exist some corresponding object for this natural and innate desire for this more. So he concludes from this, this something, this more, this something, is what people call God and life with God. So that's the argument from desire. Now, obviously, it requires a little bit of unpacking. So let me do that, and I'll run through this. And again, I'll try to be as quick as I can, 
and then we can open up the discussion and we can begin talking about this in greater detail and in greater depth. But every natural and innate desire in us corresponds to some real object that can satisfy that desire. I think that this is the most important claim that Peter Kreeft is making in this, ar in this argument. So I want to talk about it a little bit. First of, all, first of all, what we have to do is we have to distinguish between what Peter Kreeft calls natural, innate desires and secondary desires natural desires and artificial desires. Those two words, natural and innate, are very important. So what's a natural and innate desire? Let me give you some examples, and I think that this will be fairly, I think this will be fairly self-explanatory as I go. But natural and innate desires would be desires for food, for drink, for sex, for friendship, these are basic human needs, and they're natural and they're innate. Indeed, I would argue that these desires for food, drink, sex, friendship, they're universal as well. You find these wherever you go. Wherever you encounter human beings, you're going to encounter people who want food. Natural and innate. But then there are secondary desires, artificial desires, and those would be things like wanting your sports team to win the championship, wanting a really nice car, wanting to be a famous, a best-selling author, wanting to be a famous musician. This, is, this pains me to admit this when I was in high school. One of my first major dreams was to be a heavy metal singer. That's right, a heavy metal singer. And I'm very glad now, in retrospect, that I didn't get that wish because as it, as it happens, I speak for a living and I don't think my voice would have survived that. But obviously, that's the desire to be a heavy metal singer is not natural and innate. It's something I very much wanted in those years, but it's not a natural, innate desire. Now, I want, I want us to notice something about natural desires and artificial desires. Natural desires remain constant and stable across the board. Everybody has them. But artificial desires are different when we talk to different people. They're varied. They really, they, they're acquired. They have a lot to do with the culture in which we find ourselves. They have a lot to do with our individual personalities. Some people want to be Captain America. Other people want to be a famous athlete. But those are secondary desires. So when people often hear argument from desire in conjunction with argument for God's existence, they'll think, well, there are many things I want that aren't true. I wish I could fly, but no matter how much I wish and how much I believe in myself, I'll never be able to fly. But that's where we need to distinguish these two different kinds of desires. Peter Kreeft is not arguing that desire itself alone proves the existence of anything. He's arguing that natural innate desires have a corresponding object. So it's important to bear that in mind. Now, I want to introduce a further distinction. And I'm, I'm not doing this because I want to be needlessly complicated or convoluted. I think this is, a, this is an important distinction. And I'm going to introduce this distinction into, the na into natural desires. So I think natural desires fall into two basic kinds. There are basic natural desires, and then there are existential natural desires. Basic natural desires and existential natural desires. And the best way to distinguish these two, the basic from the existential, is that basic desires, basic natural desires, have to do with your survival. So a basic desire would be food and drink. That has to do directly with staying alive. But existential natural desires have, have to do with the quality of your life. So on the basic level, you desire food and drink. But on the existential level, you may desire a meal shared with friends or a meal specially prepared where a lot, of, a lot of careful preparation went into it, a lot of maybe even art went into it. Some people view food preparation even as a form of art, and it is in some cases. But those extra elements that add a distinct quality to it, sharing a meal with friends, laughter, and, and the joy that comes with it, and just savoring the flavor, really pausing to enjoy it, those are the existential elements. They have to do with the actual quality of our existence. 
Now, I think the existential elements for whatever reason, have in the past tended to be downplayed. We, we've, we've not taken them as seriously. And I think that this has been a problem. And so I want to bring in a further illustration to show why I think it is that existential, the existential dimension, the existential desires are so important. In our affluent Western context, many of us, we're, we live in a modern society where we're surrounded by conveniences and we have a lot of Easy. We have, in many ways, we have easy lives, especially compared to the lives people led historically. We have a very high quality of life. The lifespan of the average individual has been extended as well, thanks to breakthroughs in the medical industry. So a book came out recently. It's a very interesting book, and it's called Being Mortal, and it's rocketed up the bestseller list in the United States. I'm not sure whether this has crossed the pond into the UK. But Being Mortals, written by a medical doctor, and his name is Atul Gawanda. And once again, he's a, he's a physician, he's a medical doctor. And what he's talking about in the book is, on the one hand, the medical industry has enjoyed amazing breakthroughs. The world of medicine has, has come so far in recent years. And he argues that doctors are very well prepared to sustain life and to extend life. But they are not prepared, he argues, to help people prepare to die. That sounds very strange. But the truth is we're, we all eventually are going to die. All of us are mortal. And so doctors need to be prepared to help people die, prepare them to die, rather than just extending their life, but also prepare them for the process of dying. Now, what does that mean? Well, Here's where the existential component comes in very strongly. One of the places that is so feared, I would argue, in our modern society is a nursing home. And indeed, he talks a lot about nursing homes in being mortal. There's a lot of attention paid to nursing homes. For many of us, nursing homes call to mind a, a, way, a living nightmare. This is, this is a place that is almost like hell on earth. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some wonderful nursing homes out there providing some wonderful care. But nevertheless, in many of our minds, I think we tend to associate nursing homes with the loss of human dignity, the loss of our freedom. And in a sense, all of the existential components that have to do with the quality of our life, the quality of our life gets sacrificed for mere survival in this kind of a setting. You're just being kept alive. All of the other factors, or at least a significant portion of the things that have made your life so important, the choices and your freedoms, your ability to do many basic things, are gone in a nursing home. So the existential side of this is very important. The quality of our life is incredibly important to us. So many of our desires, our natural desires, fall into this existential category that has to do with the actual quality of our existence. We're not just mere survivors. There's more to us than just flesh and blood. This is why, famously, one of the very interesting responses from Jesus Christ in the Gospels when he's led into the wilderness to be tempted, one of his responses when he's hungry, remember he's been fasting for 40 days, when the devil says, turn these stones into bread, what does he say? He says, man shall not live by bread alone. There's more to us. And so what, what is that more? Let me, let me give you some of the existential desires. And I think these, are also, I think these also fall, out, fall into the category of natural and innate. And some of the existential desires would be the need for cosmic security. Cosmic security, to know that in the end, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, as Julian of Norwich fam famously said. The desire to, to, for immortality, to live forever. But here's an interesting distinction. It's not just the desire to live for en forever. I'm going to call that there's endless life, and then there's eternal life. Endless life is just a monotonous succession of days where you grow increasingly more jaded and cynical. cynical. I think you can think, I mean, you don't want to be a vampire. That is, in many ways, a vision of hell on earth. 
What we want is a kind of life where there's newness, there's novelty, there's excitement, there's adventure. So cosmic security, eternal life, a desire for heaven, some kind of perfect realm where there isn't any more pain and suffering and sorrow, a desire for goodness, where people treat one another well, where there's true goodness and kindness and beauty, a desire for a larger life, a life where there's more than meets the eye, where your actions count for more than just what you're doing here in this temporal realm, but where there's a deeper meaning to everything. And meaning, the desire for meaning, that's a very, that's a basic, innate, existential desire. We want, we want meaning in our lives. Again, let me take you back to the nursing home. What makes a nursing home for many such a horrible place, or just the thought of it as they currently are right now, such a horrible place, is that you're, you're living life. You might, you're, you might be, your life might be secure. They're going to keep you alive, but there's no meaning to anything that you're doing. If they park you in front of a television all day, sedated, there's no meaning to that. You're alive, but you're just alive. You're just surviving. You're not really living. So meaning, the need for forgiveness, the need, the, the need to know that if, if we mess up, as we do, if we make mistakes, if we go looking for meaning in the wrong places, that we can be forgiven, forgiven that forgiveness is open to us, that we can be loved unconditionally. And also another existential need would be the desire to love, not just to be loved, but to love others. We want to give of ourselves as well. We want to give and receive. And that's why I think friendship, as basic as that desire is, that's also a deeply existential desire to connect with other people. The desire for beauty and wholeness and justice and mercy as well. That's why when we're confronted with some of the horrific items that we see on the news, Think about what happened in the park in Pakistan, for instance, on Easter, when so many children and women were killed in this act of terrorism. We tend to hear this kind of news, and regardless of where we fall on the belief spectrum, we feel pained. And I think that's a natural human response. We feel pained. If we feel nothing, I think that's cause for alarm. But usually we feel pained, and that's a desire, it's an innate desire for justice and for things to be made right. And so we need to pay attention to these kinds of desires because if they are natural and innate, now we've got to go back to Peter Kreeft's argument. He's saying that all natural and innate desires have a corresponding object. So if what we've said so far is true, if all of these desires are indeed innate and natural, that is, they're universal. You'll, whenever you encounter a human being, you're going you're gonna to find these kinds of needs, these kinds of desires. Then it would follow that there is some object corresponding to this set of needs and desires. Now, what object could possibly correspond to these kinds of desires? It has to be an object that is something more than time and space, something more than what the earth has to offer and more than earthly experience, more than the creatures on this earth. Indeed, something eternal, transcendent, but not just eternal and transcendent, but something good and something capable of love and relationship. And now this, argues Peter Kreeft, the only possible candidate for, this, for these kinds of qualifications is God. And so that's what this argument is stating. If these, are, if these desires are indeed natural and innate, they're present in everybody, and if every natural innate desire corresponds to an object, then God, argues Peter Kreeft, is that object. Because if Christianity is true, it means that an all-loving, transcendent, perfectly good being who is relational, indeed intrinsically relational. Christians believe in a God who is triune, that is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who exists in perfect fellowship with himself and who is self-sufficient entirely in need of nothing, not in need of us or creation at all. But that this God, this triune, holy, self-sufficient God, creates us not out of obligation, not out of necessity, but out of love, out of the sheer exuberance of his kindness and his mercy. 
So therefore, existence, according to Christianity, is a gift. It's an act of grace. We don't have to be alive. We get to be alive. And God has made us for himself. And that's why, taking a leaf from Augustine of Hippo, the great bishop, he once said, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Augustine sounding very existential indeed in that moment. But that's what Christianity claims to be true. And Peter Kreeft and C.S. Lewis as well are both saying that our desires, our natural innate desires, are more than just desires, but they give us a powerful clue into the very structure of reality itself. Now, whether we're persuaded by this argument or not, I do think that it at least deserves to be taken seriously. And I do think that it raises a number of different issues that deserve our attention. I think to just sweep it under the rug and dismiss it would be a mistake. I think there's more going on here than meets the eye. But nevertheless, you can deny this argument, of course. You can deny it. You can, and probably the best way to deny this argument would be to say that not everybody has this desire. You, Cameron, you're talking about this desire for something more. You're talking about this unquenchable human desire, but maybe, maybe the poetically inclined or the artistic or creative kind of people feel this, but not everybody feels that. I'm happy with my life. I've got a good life. And you may have a good life. And indeed, many of us do have good lives. We lead, we lead good lives. We're happy. We have fulfilling relationships. And so this argument, one of the weaknesses of it is that it does rely, it depends on a certain level of introspection and honesty from the people who hear it as well. And all I can say in response to that, if you deny this universal human longing for something more, is that the testimony of humanity speaks against you on this one. There's a very strong conviction down the ages that nothing in this world and nothing in earthly experience will give you lasting fulfillment. You can get wonderful temporal fulfillment. Sex will gratify you for a time. Fame will gratify you for a time. Money will gratify you for a time. But again and again, we hear that the, the fulfillment is temporal. It's not lasting. There's something more that we still want. And again, a lot of people who have experienced astounding success continue to be driven to seek out more, to acquire, whether that's more wealth or acquire a richer tapestry of experiences, to travel more. And there's this relentless search for more, 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 no matter how much we have. And so if this argument, if this desire is not constant, in a sense, you have to give Mick Jagger the answer to why he can't get no satisfaction. Where is that relentless drive coming from? But let me, let me end on, on a somewhat inquisitive note. And I'll try, to sum, I'll, I'll try to summarize a little bit here what we've said so far. So let me summarize. We've said that Peter Kreeft has said, every natural innate desire in us corresponds to some real object that can satisfy that desire. There exists in us a desire which nothing in time, nothing on earth, nothing in our earthly experience, and no person or creature can satisfy. Therefore, there must exist something more than this earth, something more than time, more than space, more than all the creatures and the experiences that surround us. This something is what people call God and eternity with God. That's the argument that we've summed up so far. And I've argued that not just the basic needs for food and shelter and drink, but also the existential needs for friendship and meaning and hope, that all of these are basic human needs, that all of these actually are, are innate natural desires. And if that's the case, if Peter Kreeft is right, then they point to some real object. So let me end on an inquisitive note. The, way to, the best way to go after the argument, as I said, is to deny this universal human longing for more. Now, I think the person who did this the best, and I think one of the most consistent atheists I've come across, is Sigmund Freud. Now, I have a, I have a soft spot for Sigmund Freud. 
possibly because I was born and raised in Vienna, Austria, which was his hometown. So there's an affinity there. I also admire him as a thinker. I admire Freud's honesty. I admire, I admire the rigor of his thought. I admire his creativity. But he stuck so doggedly to what he believed. And I, though I disagree with him profoundly, I, f- I find a lot to admire in Freud. And Freud, didn't, he, he argued that Christianity is a species of nothing more than wish fulfillment. There's nothing more to it than that. And it's interesting because psychoanalysis, I'm not sure about its reception nowadays in the UK, but in the United States, psychoanalysis, the, te- the therapeutic technique pioneered by Freud, has a sort of goofy, humorous feel to it in the United States. People think of somebody telling you to lie down on the couch and talk about your feelings and just cry a little bit, and everybody sort of has a laugh about it. But that has very little in common with Freud's extremely stoical and austere project. You see, psychoanalysis was originally meant to progressively dismantle all of the illusions that you're using to hide from a cruel and pitiless universe. And so I want to give you a quote from Freud that I think is extremely revealing. He once wrote in a letter to a friend, he said, The moment a man questions the meaning and value of life, he is sick, since, objectively, neither has any existence. So the moment somebody questions the meaning and value of life, they are, by, in Freud's estimation, sick, because life doesn't have any meaning or value. And if you think it does, and if you're worried about chasing meaning and value, then you're chasing illusions, and you're living your life in an illusion. And this is why all of Freud's disciples ended up breaking with him, because he stuck doggedly by this assumption that life has no hope. And he recognized that to offer any greater or higher hope was to offer a kind of religious option. And he was unwilling to do it because he didn't believe in religion. He didn't believe in God. All of his, all of his disciples, whether, were, whether it was uh, Carl Jung or Adler, they all broke with him on this one. But Freud stuck doggedly to it. I think that's the austere crossroads that we come to. If you deny that these existential longings, I'm going to lean just on the existential longings now. If you deny the hunger for meaning and purpose and deep and fulfilling relationships, if you deny that those point to any lasting corresponding object, then I think you're left with very bleak conclusions. Doesn't mean that it's not true necessarily, but it does, it does have some bleak entail- entailments. And that would be that you are living in a universe that is without hope. Now, as it happens, I don't believe we live in a universe that is hopeless. I don't believe that these desires, the, the deepest innate existential desires we experience are mocking us. I think they're actually telling us something very powerful about the nature of reality. I think they're giving us a clue to the existence of an all-loving, all-powerful God who has created him, who has created us for him to be in relationship with him forever. So that's where I'll end it. And I think now we can open it up to questions and, and have a discussion. Well, thank you, uh, Cameron, uh, for that. And just a reminder, if folks would like to ask a question of Cameron, they can do so by pressing the raise hand button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Or indeed, you can submit questions anonymously by hitting the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen. We do have a couple questions that have been submitted anonymously. Let me I just read those um, to you. Um, uh, I am unfamiliar, someone says, with the argument, uh, but, for, but for example, if I desire to break laws of logic, would there be a possibility to do so, or I desire it? Yes, that's a good question. So if, if would it be possible to break the laws of logic if I desired, deeply desired to break the laws of logic? Right. In a word, no. <laughs> I would ar- and, and I would say, and I'll bring in the limitations of God here as well. God cannot break the laws of logic either, I would argue. So there are, there, are, there are different kinds of laws. There are man-made laws, which are arbitrary. We can recognize these pretty quickly. Some, in some, so in the UK, you, don't, you drive on the different, a different side of the road than we do in the United States. Uh, 
those those are those are man-made laws. They're upheld in the court, but they can they can be broken. But then there are laws that cannot be broken. Those would be the laws of logic, mathematics. They cannot be undone. And also, I would argue that a a desire to break the laws of logic would not be a natural and innate desire. That would be a desire that is acquired later, later on down the line. And so the desire to create a square circle or a rock so big you can't lift it, those kinds of desires do not arise naturally. So I would distinguish that kind of a de desire from what I'm calling natural and innate desires. Right. Uh, let me just go to our first um, hand that's raised, which is um, Blake Jinta. Let me bring him up. Hey Blake, you're live with Cameron. Hey brother. Hey Blake. Can you all right? Hey Cameron. Here you. Yeah. Um, so I I actually have a quick thought on what uh, the other person just said. It seems to me that in order to desire something, you have to have an idea of what you're desiring, um, but you can't have a concept of breaking a law of logic. So that's incoherent. You can't you can't meaningfully have that desire, anyways. Very good. Um, but I do have a few objections. I don't think that the best objection um, to the argument is that, oh, there are folks that don't have this desire. Um, yeah. My thought would be that the best objection would be to try to come up with some things that uh, people uh, have desired or can desire that can't be satisfied. So, for instance, uh, as Christians, we believe, um, or at least several Christians do, believe that there's a historical Adam, and there was a point at which Adam uh, might have desired several things that he couldn't have had. In fact, we, we have a report of him desiring something more, but there was no woman. You know, that was the ultimate object of his desire, and God created it to fulfill that. But there we have a desire uh, that isn't um, fulfilled. How do you see that relating to the argument? Well, I don't think his desire for a companion was an ultimate desire. I think it was a desire, again, for something that is basic and does have, and again, Eve, Eve is created, but he also has companionship with God. And so that does, again, the desire does have a corresponding object, whether Eve comes into play or not. What, what about the, okay, so then sex. He, he, you mentioned earlier that sex would be an example of a basic desire that has fulfillment. But in that case, Adam would have a desire that has no fulfillment. Well, I think you could make the case, and this is a little bit speculative, that prior to the existence of a female counterpart, that desire may not even exist yet. Okay. We, we, so we draw more exactly. experience as, as obviously as, you know, creatures that are sexual, but Adam, Adam may not have been at that point. Okay. So, I mean, maybe God continued to work on Adam because it wouldn't just be sex. It would be several things that uh, would come into being as God introduced them because some desires can only be satisfied when you have more than one person, you know, sort of that table fellowship is something right. that might need more. People. Right. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. Go. I was going to say, so what about uh, then like a desire? I think a lot of people, I remember myself, it's like, I really want to move this object with my mind. It seems like, you know, I should be able to do it. I should be able to develop in myself this ability to move this object with my mind. Right. <laughs> um, what about desires like that? Um, again, I think that, I think, again, those desires are real and yeah, we all want to be able to do, many of us want to be able to do Jedi mind tricks and fly and do other, but again, these are, these are secondary desires and these would be born of fiction. So they would be born of different myths or stories that we're exposed to. When I was, when I was younger, these didn't come initially through movies. They came through stories that were read to me, but Again, I would so I, again I would say that you've got a very elaborate but a secondary desire again, as opposed to an innate and natural desire on that one. One reason to think it might be innate, though, is what if we could establish that cross culturally people have independently come up with this desire to, um, you know, ha have more superpowers, so to speak. Um, wouldn't well, that mean, say that it is more innate? Yeah, I don't think you need to establish that. I think that is established. Um, I do think that that's a, so I think you can have secondary desires that are widespread and fairly common. They might take different manifestations. Some people might want to be Jedis. Some people might want to be Captain America, what, whatever it takes. But again, the natural and innate desires are also intimately tied to human need. 
Mm-hmm. So you actually, the, the, your, your survival depends on these things, even the existential side. So this is why, to, to draw in the nursing home example again, when you're being kept alive, you're sedated in front of a television. Many times, people in those kinds of circumstances will, will end up dying much sooner. And we know that's because basically they're deprived of living life. Mm. Uh, so, so I think basic, natural, and innate comes into play there. But the human desire to do, to, to do more, to, to fly, to, to kind of reach beyond human ability, you could, I think, argue that that's, a, that's also a desire to sort of break through human limitations. Mm-hmm. Uh, the desire to not die, I think, is the, is the most powerful and raw expression of that. And again, I would say if, if Christianity is true, then, the, the, then we won't, then that desire is legitimate and there is a corresponding life for that. Yeah. I was going to say, maybe um, if you carry the argument through, because I, I, I don't think it's that easy. To, uh, it almost seems a little ad hoc to say that that's not a, a primary desire, because it's, it, at least as I think about the relevant features um, of the desire, it seems pretty similar to the uh, primary category. But maybe if that's right, then you could follow through and say, maybe that's a reason to think we can move objects with our mind in the afterlife. Maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe we can do some of this stuff. Um, which would be an interesting conclusion. Yeah, and um, C.S. Lewis goes in that direction a little bit. You'll remember probably when he talks about different kinds of miracles in the book Miracles. He talks about miracles of the new creation, where Jesus is walking on water, and how the, the, these seem to point forward to a time where we enjoy a greater level of control over physical objects. And remember when Jesus, the resurrected Christ, appears to the disciples, he passes through walls, things like that. So yeah, just to go, just to go along with what you were saying. Yeah. And then the final one for this category of, of objection, sure. uh, maybe there are things that we can think of that can't be satisfied, is I was thinking, what about um, a desire to sin freely without culpability? So it seems like we want to sin without restraint, without um, you know being held accountable for that. But if a perfectly good God exists, then that is a logical impossibility. Mm-hmm. That's very good. So let me let me hang on an, on sort of an augustinian understanding of sin here i think that sin is misdirected desire so the problem there isn't so much that you want to sin you want to nobody nobody pursues a life that is that that is just sheer that they just want to be sheer wickedness i think they want to be able to do i think they sin because they want to achieve something good from it they think that it will make them happy they think it will bring them fulfillment and they think that the rules that are set up are getting in the way of that fulfillment. So sin is misdirected desire. And so what, hap- what needs to happen there is our desires need to be reordered and reoriented. There's a place for, and most of the things that people want, there's a place for them. They just have to be properly ordered. There's a place for sex. There's a place for pursuing your career. There's a place for success. But again, if you put them all out of order, if you place the success, your success above, the, above your career, above your family, you end up wounding your family and so on and so forth. So I think if our desires are redirected and properly oriented, they, then, then your desires won't get in the way of your fulfillment. And indeed, some would say that the greatest aspiration spiritually of the Christian life is to come to the place where you want what God wants, where mm-hmm. you say, as Jesus did, thy will be done rather than your own. If you try only to pursue your own will, you end up finding that you're pursuing a life of selfishness, which isolates you and makes you more and more lonely and then more and more miserable and tends to lead to addiction, slavery, and so on and so forth. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all from you, Blake? I have another two that I'll raise afterwards, but I'll let anybody else go. Okay. Uh, we don't currently have any other hands raised, but we do have a couple of submitted uh, questions. Uh, let me go through those, and then we can come back to Blake if there's no more hands. Um, uh, um, oh, okay. Um, folks, if you want to um, um, ask a question live, then um, you can press the raise your hand button. Otherwise, we'll work with the, um, the other uh, questions that are being submitted um, at the moment. Um, so um, Sean Sona asks, um, one, uh, so he has um, three different things he wants to ask. Contesting premise two of Peter Kreef's argument, and probably premise one as well, why not the thing we desire so much um, actually be some abstract concept of fulfillment and pleasure? Does the argument really lead us to God or some abstract concept of fulfillment? 
Yes, and that's a very good question. Was it Sean? Yeah, that was Sean. Okay, thanks, Sean, for the question. Yeah, does the do these desires really lead us to God, or could they lead us to more some abstract concept or state? I don't think they do. I think you could make that argument. But the reason I don't think that they do is because if we look at, again, if we look at the existential needs I highlighted, there many of them are inherently relational. And if, if those deep-seated existential needs are natural and innate and they're relational, then that would seem to rule out something abstract. And it would seem to point up our need for some personal being we can actually enjoy a relationship with and that we can find fulfillment in that relationship rather than some abstract state or concept. But very good question. Uh, we have a second one also from Sean. He says, can basic natural desires explain the origin of existential desires? For example, we desire to survive, so therefore we want to live in a place of pleasure and security, also known as the concept of heaven. Desire um, to reproduce and be social animals, therefore we desire relationships, romance, and friendship. Yes, I think they do. I think existential desires and are what I call the basic ones are integral. They're, they're inextricable. They, they work together. There's a, there's a lot of overlap. And so you could say that, yes, extrapolating from these basic desires, we come up with concepts of heaven. We come up with the idea of some sort of a benevolent grandfather in the sky figure. And again, this would be this would be a species of the wishful thinking argument, which was pioneered by actually really by Ludwig Feuerbach, and I think in the book The Essence of Christianity. And so I think that's I think that's one way of looking at it. The problem with it is I think it's a bit too reductionistic. It offers an it offers a possible explanation of these desires. And I and I think as an explanation it makes sense. But I don't think it explains those desires away. I think there's a difference be between saying this is why these arise, where this, this may have provided the occasion for these desires to surface or come about, and saying that this now explains them away completely. I don't think it does that. I think the fact that these desires are so conspicuously concentrated across the ages, and they seem to point so so powerfully in the direction of something that exceeds all of our human experience and abilities is a fact that is worth worth more more serious consideration. Okay, and uh, thirdly from Sean, how would you respond to non-religious people who find existential satisfaction in life? Yeah, and I think responding to non-religious people who find existential satisfaction in life is one of the greatest challenges that I face as an apologist personally, especially when I'm on the road. It's one thing to talk to people who feel a real need in their lives or feel a sense of emptiness and a lack. And then others who, who have a very good life and have it together are successful, are happy, have families. I think of, there, and there are, there are fairly well-known atheists who fit into this category. Penn Jillette, the, uh, the entertainer who's, who's, who appears on TV, he's, a, he's, a, he's famous for un, unmasking illusions. He makes this argument as well. I think that what, what needs to be borne in mind is that in the end, we're still mortal. And so no matter how much joy you pile up in life, eventually it's all going to come to an end. And that tends to leave a sense of dissatisfaction in everybody. But then also there's the, hor there's the horrific crises that happen in an individual life. It, in fact, it often takes a crisis in somebody's life, whether it's a friend being diagnosed with an illness, you're diagnosed with an illness, you lose somebody you love, a disaster happens. Sometimes it takes an event like that to remind us just of how fragile life is and how fragile we are. And also, I think that if we pay attention to the world around us and to what's going on, it becomes increasingly difficult to sustain the belief that all is well in the world. I think you can make, and, and so I, I like Penn Jillette. I think he's, I think he's really funny. And I think a lot of his arguments about basic happiness and fulfillment are good up to a point. But I also think that if you, you can say things like that from the stability of a relatively comfortable nation, like the United States or like Canada or like the UK, it's usually Westerners making arguments like this. Whereas if you live in a context like my, my mentor and friend who works with the ministry here as well, John Jaroge, he's from Kenya. 
and Kenya is absolutely, it's a country infiltrated by corruption and greed and all sorts. He's just basic. You're surrounded by injustice and poverty everywhere. And so when you're in those kinds of circumstances, you tend to see what used to be called life's wretchedness as well. So I think life is filled with glorious pleasures and you can, you can achieve a lot of earthly success. But I think to sustain, to believe that that's all that there is and that we can just live happy lives, only a privileged few can do that. And I, I think we need to be mindful of that as well. Great question. Thanks, Sean. Um, we also have um, Scott Hudson who wants to ask, uh, would someone's desires for God to not exist be a secondary desire? Right. And so this is where wishful thinking works both ways. So famous, maybe some of you will probably be familiar with uh, Thomas Nagel. He's a philosopher here in the United States, teaches at New York University. And he's, he's on record. He's an atheist. He's on record as saying, it's not just that I don't believe in God. It's that I don't want God to exist. I have a cosmic authority problem. And again, I really admire his honesty. Um, I do think, and, I'm, and this might be a little bit controversial, but yes, I'm going to argue that the existence for God to, the, well, the, the desire for God to not exist, the desire for him, to, for there not to be a God, is a secondary desire. And I think if you serve, if you speak to young children, if you, if you speak to relatively young people, the desire for some kind of a, a creator or some kind of a God or some kind of a, a larger figure tends to be the natural one. So in other words, the outlook that Freud has, that life is inherently meaningless and valueless, I don't think that's a natural way to look at the world. I think the natural way to look at the world is to, is to basically nurture the assumption that, yes, even if my life is bad, there's, there's hope. There's, that's why I'm trying. Why do, I, why do I even get up out of bed in the morning in the first place? That there's something more. So I think the, I think the desire for God is natural. I think the desire for God to not be real is secondary. Great. And Scott has a second question. He wants to know if secondary desires arise from fictions or myths, could someone expand that to say that my desire for God or meaning should be considered a desire that cannot be satisfied along the same lines as beyond at uh, reaching beyond human ability? State that again. I want to make sure I get it right. If secondary desires arise from fictions or myths, could someone expand that to say that my desire for God or meaning should be considered a desire that cannot be satisfied along the same lines as reaching beyond human ability. Yes. And again, that's what people like Freud, like Feuerbach and Christopher Hitchens later on and others would say, they would say, yeah, the desire for God is just a desire for the impossible. And you may, you may wish, wish and wish, but, by golly, Disney is wrong. If you believe in yourself, you can't make anything happen, and you can't, and that doesn't make God real. But again, I'm I'm arguing that God is not doesn't fit into the category. I don't think that he's he comes the desire for God comes about secondarily. I think it's tied to our natural and innate desires. But I think I do think that there are accretions that can happen because. As, as thoroughly encultured creatures, by that I mean social beings who live in, in a social environment, naturally we're going to pick up different, we're going to be influenced by the stories we hear, the movies we watch, the, the music we listen to, and the people who are around us because we're social creatures. And in those circumstances, this is where it does get com complex, some false notions do enter into being. And this is where specificity is needed. And so if Christianity is true, you need, you need to move. If, if you're persuaded of it, that's why you gain your insights into Christianity through prayer and through the scriptures where the specific revelation is revealed to you. And then you can, and you can gain access to more specific details in order to avoid some of the cultural idols. The, the scripture would call those idols that crop up. Okay, now let me go back to Blake. He has had his hand up for a while. Blake, welcome back. Hey, thanks. Um, quick comment on that last one. I'd actually wonder if the person actually, I, I don't think he understands what he's desiring when he says he desires for there to be no God, because if God is goodness, um, as a lot of Christian philosophers think, then this person just doesn't understand what he's saying. Um, 
And I, I had a thought on uh, the person's comment who came right after I, I spoke. Um, and he kind of asked a little bit more about people who don't share this uh, desire. And you said that you think this is like a really good, you know, probably the best objection to the argument. But as I'm looking at the premises of the argument, it, it's not an issue at all. Um, if, if a desire exists in another person, it doesn't matter whether I have the existential experience myself. The only, the, all the premise needs is for me to acknowledge that other people have the desire. So it's kind of like saying, you know what, I, something's wrong with me. Maybe I don't have a desire for hunger, but that doesn't imply that there's no food out there. So all that's required for the premise to go through is to grant that other people have, have this sort of desire. Um, so I don't, do you agree with that before I raise my objection or what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, yeah, but I, I, I think people want to deny, yeah, I, I guess I agree with it as far as it goes, but I think people, if they're, if they're going to object to the argument, what they're going to try to go after is probably that either, either that every natural innate desire has a corresponding object. They'll say that, no, not every natural innate desire does. Or this idea, and I've actually, because I've had people object to it when I was talking to them before, that there's this desire for this more. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you're right. I, I think, but I also think that's an incredibly difficult argument to make because it, again, it contradicts almost, the, well, it contradicts the collective testimony of almost everybody down the ages. We've always said we want more. And most people will grant you, yes, I want more. But I suppose then what they would say is, yeah, I don't think that that means that there's something more that will satisfy it. So yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. So it seems to me that a lot of people would come up and their objection would be, look, I don't have this desire that you're talking about. And my response would just be, okay. Um, but the question is, do you think that anybody else in here has that desire? Um, and if they say yes, then you've oh, got your first premise. Let me interject real quickly. But I made the, I'm, I made the fairly bold claim, and so does, so does Peter Crave, that this is a universal desire. So to do that, if I, if I, so if I just omit the word universal, then what you said obtains. If I say universal, then they could, all they have to do is find one exception and then. But I actually, I think you can push back there because you can point out that you can, you have people in the world right now um, that because of some malfunction, they don't ha have hunger and they can't experience these other sorts of things, you know, a desire sure. for sex. So sure. all we have to do is say, look, we're talking about natural innate desires. I'm not saying that every single human has this desire. What I'm saying is that this is a desire that's innate. And even if you person don't have this desire yourself, can you grant that there's enough literature and people testifying that this is a desire that we can grant that it's nevertheless an innate hum human desire? Yeah, well said. Fair enough. Um, okay, so here's my, here's my objection. Um, I wonder if the argument is reaching too much when you say it has to be an object. So my first question would be like, do you have, uh, like, how are you understanding object when you say that there's going to be an object to satisfy this desire? And to give you a little more context, I'm thinking of, uh, y yes, if you think of food, you know, there's an object, there's a thing there, um, food. Um, but what about That's like scary. entertainment or uh, if you want comfort or if you want sleep, these aren't necessarily objects. Right. No, I mean object in the very generic sense that it just has a corresponding object or state of affairs. So yeah, if yeah, the desire for sleep, which is another very natural, innate desire we all have, or the or but or a relational desire, both uh -huh. correspond to something non-physical. But yeah, yeah. So there's a a way to satisfy the desire, right? Uh, and then you and maybe. Some someone could come back and say, well, look, I can alter your brain so that the desire gets satisfied. And so maybe add a little bit further. Okay. There's a way out in the world to satisfy, uh, this desire. Um, yeah. So I, I think that, I don't know how, how deep of an objection that would be. Um, no, it's a good one. I mean, I think you could talk about, yeah, cult of, you know, inculcating a very elaborate illusion, and and then that that would that that could function as a way to and again this is why this is why it's a it's not a proof it's it's a I think it's a powerful clue, mm -hmm. but yeah. Look, and if there's a way to satisfy the desire, um, we're not taught. What we're saying is there's a uh, you know it's not impossible, but then as we think about these desires for um, cosmic security, um, and we have a desire for comfort and meaningfulness 
I don't think you deny that even the atheist that it's logically possible for to have these things without God. You're just, it's just going to be like really hard to obtain. Um, so if you don't need an object anymore to correspond to the desire um, and all you need is the possibility, then, you know, because the, the naturalist is going to want a, a utopia. He's going to talk about a utopia. Maybe one day we'll be able to um, form in ourselves the ability to, you know, write in this reality right here now to right. um, live forever and, and, you know, continually have these things. Yeah. So, um, That's how, where, how, how does that affect the argument? Because then the, if, if all it comes down to is there's a way to satisfy the desire, then the naturalist is fine. Yeah. So I think the most helpful guy on this one is John Gray. You know who he is? Mm -hmm. So he's, he, he taught for years at the London School of Economics. He's a philosopher. He wrote a book a number of years ago called Straw Dogs. And so I, I think that John Gray is basically carrying on the, the mantle of Sigmund Freud. But what he argues is that progress is the most elaborate myth of our own day and age. And so he says, because we've had technological progress, we've had breakthroughs in medicine, he argues that that has fooled us into thinking that we've had moral progress and that human nature is perfectible. And he says that that simply isn't the case. He said, we've had breakthroughs in medicine, but we've also had breakthroughs in nuclear warfare. And now there's the threat of nuclear proliferation. And we have some of the most heinous crimes in all of humanity in the 20th century, which were all carried out during enlightened sort of modern and uh, advanced societies. And so what he says this does is it should reduce to dust all of our illusions that there's some utopia awaiting us. And, that, and he says there is no golden age. And even, even if, trans, even if the, the goals of transhumanism are realized and human life is extended indefinitely, then Again, I, I, I introduced the distinction a while ago between what's what I called eternal life and endless life. Endless mm -hmm. life does not satisfy the desires for that, that we have, which would be eternal life, where there's perpetual newness, where we experience real joy and beauty, whereas endless life is, a, is really just an endless succession of days. It grows emptier and emptier. We grow more jaded and more cynical. So I think you can, I think you can, you can, say that there's no corresponding object. I deny that. I think you can deny that. But I think if you deny it, you need to own the fact that you're denying, in a sense, deep, the deepest hope that has animated the human heart for centuries. I do think that goes away. I don't think that you have, I don't think that there's going to be a heaven on earth. And anytime we've tried to, we've tried to organize heaven on earth, it's been hell on earth. Yeah. Um, just one, one last thought there, just to kind of, uh, follow through with wh where the force might be, mm. uh, is so like right now we have these desires, um, that aren't satisfied here. Um, and so you're saying that they, uh, okay. So they, they exist elsewhere to be, they, they must exist elsewhere. Um, so uh, then the, uh, how would I frame this? So if we have, Um, no, I'll, I'll set that aside. I don't think that's right. Okay. So one, one more objection, then I'll hand it over to everyone else. Um, so one obviously popular objection is going to be, okay, we, we're, we can explain these desires through the evolutionary process. Uh, it's natural that we would desire for sex and these things because they're adaptive. And also we're going to be desiring, um, uh, fellowship and we're going to be desiring a lot of these things because in cultures that get along and that right. find their meaning in helping each other right. um, these cultures are going to are going to do better at survival yep. so whenever you get a, a genetic mutation that associates you know a fulfillment of desire with you know meaning meaningful actions it amplifies that and now here we are today with these desires um, uh, that are naturally produced and they don't necessarily have any any corresponding afterlife. So if I desire to go on um, living a meaningful life and to be happy, that's just an extension of what I already have. I want more of that. Right. So how, how do you go after that objection? Yeah, and that's a that's obviously one that comes up immediately. That this this desire for God is just a survival mechanism, and it's animated people down the centuries because it's contributed to greater human fellowship and flourishing but now it's unnecessary. And what I would say to that is, first of all, that might be the case. 
but again, that doesn't that doesn't explain it away. So I'm person I'm not persuaded of a macro evolutionary model, but macro evolution wouldn't rule out the existence of God for me. Uh, God could be using macro evolution as his way of sustaining the creation. That just could be one of his processes. And so in that sense, yes, then you could say that the desire for God is a survival mechanism that's natural and innate, implanted by God to drive us and to sustain civilization. And again, explaining something doesn't necessarily, it, well, explaining its origin or how it came about doesn't necessarily explain it away. That's the genetic fallacy. And so, and moreover, if the desire for God's existence is indeed a survival mechanism, as, as the naturalist may claim, couldn't that also point to the fact that our survival depends on God? Hmm. I, well, I'm, so I think that in order for this argument to work, we actually do have to take up a theistic model where God creates in us these desires. And because God is a good God, he's not going to mislead us. He's not because otherwise the desires would be misfiring. We'd be desiring things that can't be fulfilled. So I think at bottom, the argument depends on a generally um, theistic out outlook or, or approach or um, understanding of the human design plan. But you um, point out another problem with it, though, too, from an evolutionary standpoint. How does mm -hmm. evolution program anything? This is a much larger problem for evolution. evolution. If evolution is a random, unguided process, why are we attributing it, attributing agency to it, in a sense? So how would evolution implant, how would a purely impersonal force implant in us a desire or do anything at all? Yeah, so this, this, yeah this is where evolution alone, I think, runs into some, some trouble. Yeah, so you, you run the argument, and then when someone brings up the evolution objection, you say, look, I think there are, there are problems with evolution. But then, you, of course, if you can show that evolution has problems, then you've got a more direct argument to God's existence, namely an argument from, from design. Do. Um, but I've so. often, it's often the reason I, the reason I framed it the way I did is because it, people off, will often say evolution, boom, that's kind of the trump card. And I yeah. said, yeah, but evolu evolution doesn't threaten my belief in God. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, it, no, it, it, it's not being raised as an objection to God's existence. It's being raised as a way to undercut the argument because. No, I know. But oftentimes people, when they invoke evolution, they think that basically that's, that's the beginning of dismantling the whole ed edifice. And I don't, and I don't think it necessarily is. But yeah, in this case, they're going after a specific, a very specific argument. Right. So I think if, there's a mindset behind it often. Yeah. If naturalistic evolution really is true, then it seems to me that the argument would have been undermined. If naturalistic right. evolution is true, and that's because um, these aren't actually pointing to genuine desires out in the world. These are just things that um, were adaptive, and now right. here we are thinking that there are desires that can be fulfilled. That you know, the only reason they're there is because they were adaptive. So um, at the end, I, I think that's you know, for most all naturalists that you come across, that's going to be at, at the bottom because you, they've essentially got to reject evolution for the argument to go through for them. Right. Okay. So, just a thought. Yes, and sir. I think that's all I have. I, uh, thanks for, I'm, I'm probably going to be heading out pretty soon, but thanks for, you know, a bunch for coming out and doing this with us. Uh, yeah. Thanks for talking. Thank yeah. you. Thank well, you, Blake. Um, yep. I think I've got time for probably one more question. Okay, sure. Uh, we have um, Sean Sauna who has his hand raised. Let me bring him up. Okay. Hi, Sean. Uh, you Sorry. Wait, wait. wait. Uh, sorry, you were you were muted. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry again, Sean. You were you were muted there for a second. Go ahead. Oh, you're sorry. muted again, Sean. <laughs> um, hang on. Let me. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Okay, now go ahead. <laughs> hey, Cameron. Hey, Sean. How you doing? I'm good. Uh, so thank you for uh, talking to us. Um, I heard that you. Have we only had time for one question, but I actually have two questions. That's fine. Bring them on. So let me just go to the first one then. So premise two of uh, Peter Creep's argument. Um, if let me let me see if I'm saying it right. It's like there's a desire that exists that nothing in space and time can satisfy. Um, yeah. and what I'm what I'm wondering is like how would you go about proving that a desire exists that cannot be satisfied in space and time? Like you know, for example, somebody might say after being rejected by a girl, "Oh, I feel like there's no one who can ever satisfy me anymore." Right. 
often see more of an emotional response rather than a reasonable response. So how can we prove that, you know, we can't be satisfied by things in time and space? Yeah. I'd, yeah. That's a good question. So how can we prove that we don't, that we can't be satisfied by things in time and space and earthly experience? And again, I think the argument is not so much a proof for God's existence. It's a clue. So I think what we would do in this case is just say that the, the fact is it's more, the conspicuous element here is that we just always desire more no matter what we get. So if we always desire more, let's, we, we end up with the girl we want, or we get the house we desire, or we get the job we want pretty soon. I mean, it's just, it goes without saying, we know that that desire is going to be replaced by another one and then another one. And then, and then oftentimes an even stronger desire as you go down the line. And so what this does is it, it's evidence, it's not proof, but it's evidence that there's something that, that isn't in the sphere of earthly experience that can, that must, that if, if this desire for this more, it point, as Peter Crave says, it points down an infinite corridor. So if there's something more that then it's, that's why it would have to be outside of human experience, because no matter how much we have within human experience, that never seems to quell the longing that we have. And there's always another desire. And if we get what we want, we want more of it somehow. And we never feel satisfied and fulfilled. And actually another important word here is at rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I, well, I'm j I mean, just to ask more questions about that point, you know, for sure. example, if I'm continuously unsatisfied by something, um, it could be just like my emotional or psychological state. But eventually I could reach satisfaction in that. So uh, like, even if you have an infinite like line of like, okay, I, I keep on wanting to be satisfied, that doesn't necessarily lead us to God or some eternal, you know, spiritual dimension. So I'm still wondering, like, how do you make that leap from, you know, the argument all the way to God? Yeah, it doesn't necessarily do that. But what it does do is it shows that in human nature, there seems to be an unquenchable need. And it manifests itself in a number of different places. and but behind it, there's, there's, there's a longing that I think if you look, if you examine the basic human desires, you can look at it in a more organized fashion rather than looking at all the different instances in your own life. And that would be the way, that's why Peter Kraft and others have separated them into the basic human needs, you know, food, sleep, sex, friendship, and then meaning, hope, purpose. People find meaning in different ways and hope and purpose, but everybody wants hope and meaning and purpose. And if you take those out of their life, life becomes unendurable. And so I think if we look at that, the only, it, and if we, if we see that nothing in earthly experience satisfies these various natural innate desires, then the reason that you make a leap to God, and, and it is a leap, uh, but the reason that Peter Kraft and others make the leap to God is because that what these desires are is they're infinite and they're eternal and they're, they're, they're desires for something that's timeless, eternal, infinite, and transcendent. And so the only thing that fits those qualifications would be an infinite, transcendent, eternally good being of some sort. So that's where that leap comes in. Okay. And this will be my last question. Yes, sir. Um, so when you, you when we discuss, for example, like uh, one of the I think it was the uh, existential natural desires was the desire for cosmic purpose, right. and you know having you know some meaning like why is humanity as a whole here at all? Right. And then you know as cult, as the culture becomes more secular and moves away from religious ideas, you know for example in a recent debate with or not recent but with like William Lane Craig, Richard Dawkins, it was like a panel, and. Uh, you know, one of the judges concluded, well, why not humans be the purpose givers? So it's like when humanity was more religious and cultures weren't so secular, we mm -hmm. began to say to ourselves, okay, yeah, we need cosmic purpose. But then as cultures have become more secular and maybe more individualistic, people, right. say, we, we come up with a purpose ourselves. So is it possible that the concept of cosmic purpose will disappear? And therefore, you know, we don't have this existential desire anymore. It's theoretically possible that the, that the desire for cosmic purpose will disappear, I suppose, but I, but I, don't, I think it's highly, highly unlikely. And the first, the first reason I would point to is that 90%, and actually it's, it's probably much higher than that, of the globe is religious. The atheists the, and the non-believers or the skeptics represent a tiny, tiny faction. That doesn't necessarily say that, Chris, that religious belief is true or false, but it is a conspicuous factor when we're considering human longings and needs, if the, if the vast majority of the global population believes in some kind of a spiritual higher power, 
then that would seem to say that our need for cosmic security and purpose is intimately tied to a being that's greater than ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions, guys. Is that all you have time for? I'm afraid so. Okay. But, uh, thanks for having me on the on the uh, on the show again, guys. This has been great. Yeah, you are most welcome. It's been a pleasure having you. All right. Well, have a good rest of your Saturday, everybody. All right. Well, thank you, Cameron. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a fun session. Hey, Jonathan, yes. are you recording? did you record that? Uh, yes, did you not want to be recorded? No, no, I, no, I just, yeah. you know, I just wanted to watch it later because I wanted to like restudy everything. Okay, yeah, I, I did record it. Um, yeah. All right, thank you, Jonathan. You're welcome. One thing I was going to ask, uh, but <clears throat> he came and ran out, of, ran out of time, maybe this might be a discussion we could have, is how to use this argument. Um, when I was an atheist, there were, you know, there, were some, there were some arguments that were used, some uh, were good, some were not so much, but there were some arguments that were never presented to me that I can remember. And I heard about them after I became a Christian, and I, I thought about them. I wonder how good that argument would have been had I heard it as an atheist. And two of them are Pascal's wager and the argument from desire. <clears throat> and I have thought, okay, if I heard Pascal's wager as an atheist, I don't know that that would have convinced me. Uh, and so I've been thinking about the argument from desire. After becoming a Christian, I see it. But as an atheist, uh, I don't know. So when do you think would be a good time to use the argument from desire as an argument with, uh, with an atheist? I personally wouldn't because there's so many stronger arguments out there to choose from. Um, slightly unlogical argument. Yeah, it might be a valid and sound argument, but there's plenty of stronger ones to choose from that are far more persuasive and uh, compelling. Yeah, I've been trying to think of how I would use it <clears throat> because I think it's true, but I didn't didn't know it was true until after I became a Christian. So I'm just not sure how uh, how persuasive it would have been before I believed that there was even a God. Hmm. Um, folks, if anyone else wants to join the sort of after show further discussion, then just raise your hand and I'll fit you in the panel as well. One thing that a friend of mine uh, observed was that people could be convinced that, for instance, Jesus rose from the dead bodily, but still not get the big picture of why that mattered with regards to their salvation or why they would need to submit their life to that kind of uh, person. Um, and so I think that these kind of arguments can be helpful at getting deeper into our humanity, that is like engaging our heart in some of these questions that otherwise atheists and other people, or even just uh, nominal believers, uh, might not really, they might not really be engaging in this. And so they, these, these kind of arguments can be helpful in thinking about us, uh, our, the reality of the things we're talking about. So it's almost not maybe per se the best argument for bringing up in favor of God's existence, but for why this matters. If all of our desires really can be satisfied, then that's a radically different kind of universe. And that, I mean, that, that's a truth that, that um, or at least a possible truth that we need to take seriously because that means the good desire, like the, um, that, that, there, that greatness is possible um, just as a thought. Like, um, does that make sense? You know, Hello. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I think I'll put in a one now. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think like Cameron said that this is not really a proof. It's only uh, uh, what is this? What uh, it points towards God's existence, but it's not a proof. It's not a right a deductive syllogism. Uh, I think I disagree. I think we can uh, make the argument from desire. Well, we can uh, turn it into a proof. And here's how I'm going to go about it. Uh, so, for one thing. Uh, well, for that we have to uh, go to Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, of course. Uh, I think we can uh, change the argument from desire into a version of the fifth way. Fifth way is the Thomistic uh, teleological argument. Every agent acts for an end, and unintelligent agents uh, are you know, brought to an end by an intelligent agent. Well, we, we can go into that. Uh, so here's how I'm going to go about it. Uh, the human mind is intrinsically oriented towards being. Being is the principle which, by which it knows everything else. Being is the first principle of our knowledge. Being both in potency or possibility and being in act. That is actual being which we apprehend, which we experience. Now, and uh, so, be, uh, so truth is our apprehension of being. And good is our desire of being. So, our desire, all our desires, can be, you know, simplified to a desire for being. Yes. Now, uh, now what we want, what all of us want, is you know, being that doesn't perish. You know, we want to continue in existence. We, none of us really wants to die. Even people who, you know, uh, wish to, you know, kill themselves, and suicide is the most irrational thing in the world. Uh, even those who want to commit suicide, uh, if they were given, say, a magic wand which would, you know, erase all their problems in life, uh, then it, uh, they would, uh, you know, automatically do it. No one uh, wants to, you know, just die simply sit up. People, even people who want to die, they, you know, they're pushed to it. Uh, so what we really want is being which, you know, endures, being which does not perish, being which, you know, in which enriches us. And of course, as we can see, nothing in space and time is that kind of being. All Everything in space and time is contingent being. We ourselves are contingent beings. So, yes, so definitely our, uh, you know, desire towards being points us to, you know, necessary being. Uh, that's God. Now, uh, now, yes, then there's the question of whether this desire is, you know, something constructed by society or whether it's natural. Mm, you know, there are, you know, there have been recent papers which argue that, you know, we are, you know, neurologically wired to theism. We, we have this innate tendency to, you know, uh, attribute agency to nature. We have this innate tendency to, you know, make, you know, all of existence, all of reality personal. Uh, so yes, uh, this uh, desire towards uh, you, our desire for God is indeed very natural. So how did it come about? Yes, you can bring in evolution, and I really have no problem with evolution. But uh, sorry, Taito, Sal. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with evolution. But here's what we need to do to you know undercut the whole evolution uh, objection. Uh, that is, we need to show that the human intellect is immaterial. It's not something, it's not a body. It's not something which is, you know, made of atoms, whatever. It's, 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 it's not a body, it's immaterial. And since it's immaterial, it's, you know, uh, the human intellect uh, cannot be the product of evolution. Sure, the, the human intellect, though immaterial, depends on the brain and the brain being the organ of, uh, you know, imagination that is you know forming images uh, the intellect requires the brain to you know act to you know know anything except maybe be just plain being simplicity uh, but the intellect itself is uh, something that well uh, we need to go into you know some of the um, you know the classical arguments for the 
immaturity of the intellect. Uh, I don't want to go into that. But since we all, you know, accept that the intellect is immaterial, yes, yes. No, not a good. I want to make sure I'm understanding. Okay. Does your does your is your point relating to this argument from desire? Is that your point? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if we can show that uh, that the human intellect is immaterial, then the human intellect cannot have emerged by an evolutionary process. Sure, our bodies, our brains, everything emerged uh, by evolutionary processes. I grant that, but not uh, our immaterial intellect. It, being immaterial, it cannot, you know, be. Uh, it cannot emerge from matter. Uh, since uh, I think we can all uh, uh, grant that. Uh, so the question is, where does it come from? Uh, what makes our intellect, you know, go towards being? What moves our intellect? Here, of course, we come to the, uh, you know, the classic maxim that the great Aristotle wrote in Greek, which I don't know, but which in Latin is quit quit mortem, a value mortem. Whatever is moved is moved, moved by something else. Our intellect, you know, in knowing something changes we have, you know, we gain a concept. So our intellect is moved. What is it that moves our intellect? What causes this change? We go, uh, here we can go into the first way, the argument for motion. Uh, so, you know, uh, the intellect has a motion of its own, but since it is changing, it requires something to, you know, change, uh, to, for it to be changed. Uh, so, since there cannot be an infinite regress of, uh, you know, of movers which are themselves being moved, there must be an immovable mover. Mm. At Habdistimus Deum, uh, this mover we call God. Yeah, so it's, we have gone into a version of the first way now, not the fifth way. But yeah, the first way and the fifth way are, you know, complements of each other. The fifth way is that in, in, every motion is towards an end, every process, every change is towards an end. And the end to, uh, to which we are moved is being and there is something which you know, uh, you know, pushes us in that direction. And this being is pure at God. Uh, but here's uh, here's where the first way ends. Here we go go into the fifth way. Now, whatever gives you know this motion, this orientation towards being, must itself have being, and it must have being since. Uh, you know, it must have being in all its fullness, right? Well, if you go from the first way to the fifth way, the teleological argument, uh, then uh, we can uh, very easily go to the, you know, uh, conclusion that not only is this being, this is since uh, this being is also what moves the intellect, it is intellect itself, it's intellect in itself. As the great Aristotle put it, uh, this, you know, pure act is most noises, thought thinking itself. Or, well, the logos, if you will. Uh, and then, so, and this being, this pure act is what draws us all. It, it uh, you know, it is uh, as truth, it is, you know, as it, as it presents, uh, uh, as it, as it uh, presents itself to our minds, our, you know, intellect, it is truth. And as it presents itself to our uh, will, our rational appetite, it is the good. So, uh, so being is truth, being is good. And so he, uh, we have uh, already, uh, you know, established uh, at least two of uh, the uh, attributes of God. God is intellection itself. He's subsistent intellection. He's pure nose, pure mind, and he's goodness itself. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the way I think we can, you know, turn this into a... Uh, mm, into yeah, a proof. And here's what I think. Uh, like we all know, uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, well, I wouldn't say he was a Thomist, since well, uh, I've heard he was a hedonist, and you know, hedonists are not exactly into virtue ethics. But yeah, he was definitely an Aristotelian. Uh, if you've read uh, his uh, works of fiction, uh, he has he definitely has very uh, good things to say about Aristotle. Mm, well, I think this is. Well, I like to think that this is exactly what uh, Lewis had in mind, the Aristotelian teleological, uh, you know, uh, metaphysics. Uh, 
uh, someone had said that uh, i don't know his name uh, he was there uh, the other uh, person not cameron the other person what was his name you said who was the other yeah the other person during the uh, uh i don't know his name never mind uh he said that uh that you know for this argument to work it needs a theistic worldview mm, not a theistic worldview you know but an aristotelian worldview yes and you can uh well uh you know establish the aristotelian worldview without assuming theism you just need the principle of causality in establishing the principle of causality would take a little bit of work not that much but yeah once you establish that you bring about all the four kinds of causes net ideal efficient formal final from that yeah you get the aristotelian worldview okay yeah now this is the first thing i want to say uh, i think uh, we can also bring from this an argument for why the incarnation had to take place but mm, i'll go into that after if, uh, after you have, uh, uh, well if you have any questions i'll try to answer them if uh well after that maybe we can go into my argument for why the incarnation had to take place questions others others may have questions i i'd like what <clears throat> i like that uh, you're making and daniel's making that, uh, with an atheist uh this may not be a a strong argument but it is a way to take the argument from just intellectual to personal to experience and uh i agree of course yes i i think i think that's important because a lot of times with an atheist they want to stay intellectual they want to they they don't want to dive into the personal and when you approach that <clears throat> they they get upset mm -hmm. so this argument from desire may be a way to get there uh from the intellectual to the to the personal to the ex yes. existential yeah uh, instead of appealing to the intellect you appeal to the will yes i get that but uh, the thing is uh, you know well <laughs> well coming from you know uh you know the thomistic world view we kind of uh, you know subordinate the will to the intellect mm, so i don't know uh, it's it's better if we show that this is you know epic will is uh, you know can be harmonized with the appeal to the intellect we, we can make it into uh, you know uh, an argument for look uh, everything's better if god exists and we can also you know from the way we can jump into the intellect and we can show that yes and guess what this is how it actually is god does exist not only is it good that god should exist it is uh, it's also truth that god exists we can make that leap but we need you know uh to bring aristotle into it this is a great aristotle um one of the oh, did you want to go sorry no please go ahead Danny. um one of the issues with bringing aristotle into it and i think we'd be better off if we did bring aristotle into it uh but one of the problems is that our society has rejected two of the four causes that aristotle kind of put forward and i think yes. i think he might have been observing something real there when he said that there were not only uh material causes and um efficient efficient thank you um but there's also the formal and final causes and we totally yes. deny those because we think they're not necessary we don't see that sophistication as being part of the real world and so i think that this would be uh almost an emotional barrier to this argument because we would automatically I, by we i mean our culture might automatically dismiss the possibility of our desires being um having some sort of grounding or needing some kind of cause because we wouldn't even say that our biology and gigabytes of information in our dna require um require any sort of intelligent explanation um and so and what i mean by that is that um we we think we can kind of just hand wave and say oh well there's this process of of chance and there's this process of selection in some kind of ambiguous sense and we think that's enough i think that many people might kind of ambiguously have the same same um 
kind of response to both Aristotle's thinking as well as um, kind of this argument. From, though I don't think it's it's a good I don't think it's a good objection. Uh, uh, this is what I have to say to that. Uh, the thing is that uh, you know every argument for God's existence, that is every you know good argument, every sound argument for God's existence depends on the principle of causality. Because uh, the, the exception is the theological argument, which I think is unsound. The reason for that you can read in the Summa Theology, of course. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we uh, know God only as you know the cause of the effects we see. We uh, we can attain to a natural knowledge of God only as the creator of the world. Uh, for you know a personal knowledge of God as you know, through, you know, revelation, through, you know, in the church, that's not, uh, that's, you know, that's, you know, outside the scope of what can be gleaned, uh, you know, via philosophy. So for this, you know, for, to bring back the Aristotelian, you know, worldview, we need to really, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, prove the principle of causality, which can easily be done, of course. But, you know, uh, we need to first, you know, uh, teach people what exactly, you know, scholars, you know, Aristotelian scholastics, you know, what they mean by causality, not, you know, one event falling under the event, not the stupid human uh, uh, idea of, you know, billion balls hitting one another, not that. If that's what people think causality is, it's very easy to deny that the principle of causality is, you know, uh, is a universal, it's a universal proof. So yeah, we'd have to begin from the principle of causality. That's how you, uh, you know, get into, you know, you bring all the four causes. That's how Aristotle did it. That's how we do it. I have another question if, um, if unless anyone else does, because I've already kind of spoken, but... Uh... Do you have a question, Tito? Or... You kind of looked like you had a question there, so sorry, I'm sorry to call you out. <laughs> I'm Salvador Cordova. I, um, there's a technical problem that keeps using the name of my computer and not me. That's just who I am. Um, Hello. I, I feel kind of bad because I, I, I missed most of the discussion, so I feel... Me too, me too. I, I feel like I, I don't really have much of a right to say much. However, um, I don't use the argument from desire, uh, mm -hmm. from God. Uh, I, I think the human heart is, uh, it has a lot of deceitful desires, so it's, it's not really a, a good guide to truth. Uh, I, think, I think objective facts are the best evidence for God, and a, a heart that, if someone is willing to overcome some of their natural desires, I also think that uh, people that are not Christians are naturally inclined not to want the Christian God to exist. I mean, the God that a non-Christian wants is, is uh, 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 not the Christian God. And um, in, in many respects, uh, the Christian God is something that most of humanity wouldn't want. So mm. I, I don't think that... Uh, the human heart is a, is a good guide. When I have tried to encourage people that are wrestling with their Christian faith, um, I, I usually use, uh, I found evidential arguments much more uh, powerful than, than uh, philosophical. And uh, sometimes when God works in miracle, that, that has more effect than anything I could say. Uh, one young lady I know that was an agnostic, um, she came to become a Christian because uh, uh, she saw miraculously answered prayer for a friend that uh, was on life support. They pulled the life support. They expected her friend to die, but she lived. And uh, like a thousand people were praying for her. That's the sort of thing that, you know, no amount of words can, can, can have that sort of impact on, on a person's life. So those are just kind of my thoughts. I, I don't have much beyond that.
Uh, um, thank you, Tito. Uh, well, to that, you know, your words, you know, your point about, you know, the uh, uh, hard being, uh, you know, you know, uh, hard being untrustworthy, deceitful. Uh, that's a quote from Jeremiah. Yes. Yes, that was from Jeremiah, and also quoted by Jesus. And then also in Revelation, uh, you know, Jesus being uh, God, um, people were asking mountains and rocks to fall on them. So, you know, their desire was that God not exist. Um, so, I get that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, your, your point is exactly why I said that uh, the argument from desire should be wedded to, you know, it, it shouldn't merely agree to, uh, you know, the rational appetite, uh, the, you know, just the, the way it should agree to the intellect as well. Because uh, you see, when you say that the heart is, you know, untrustworthy, uh, from my own <laughs> domestic uh, point of view, I'd say that the heart is untrustworthy only when it, you know, submits the intellect to the will and not vice versa. The will is to submit to the intellect. Uh, and of course, the animal nature of man is to submit to the rational nature of man. Uh, all the uh, that's where you know we as a race have failed. People today, they're exactly what Aristotle said. Most of them are no better than beasts. Mm. But yeah, uh, uh, <coughs> but yeah, other than that, I agree with what you said. Yes. I, mean, I think we can make the argument from, uh, I mean, um, if someone feels a need for something, like uh, uh, they're uh, in desperate need, then there's really not any argument to be made. Uh, I've known a lot of atheists who said, well, you know, go ahead and pray for me. I'd appreciate it. And I mean, that was a full statement of faith. But it, it does indicate that they know they have need. So uh, that's, you know, that's the extent I might use some sort of argument from desire. They, they have a desire for their life to be fixed. They miss and uh, during, uh, during a lot of crises, uh, people are more inclined to think about God and, and, and search for him. Uh, I, I personally think that the big cause of atheism is prosperity. When, when people are not aware of their needs, uh, when they, a lot of them are when they feel a lot of their needs are met. They don't have they don't have a lot of incentive to seek after God. Uh, yeah, there's this one point I forgot to mention. Uh, you said that a lot of people don't want you know the Christian God to exist, the Christian God to be true. Uh, let's say uh, I say that yes, that's true. But uh, here's how we go about that. We like I said, you know, you uh, you. Uh, you first, uh, not only do you appeal to the principle of causality in, you know, wedding this uh, argument from desire to, you know, you know, in making it a proof, uh, there's one more thing you need to bring into. That is, given that, uh, you know, we apprehend being through intellect and since being is good, so we can only achieve good by, our use, by the use of the intellect. Only by, you know, the submission of the will to the intellect is good achievable. Yes, once we do that, uh, then we can show that the greatest good exists, good itself, beyond the good exists, and that it is the God of the philosophers. From there we go and show that the God of the philosophers is the God who became the Theanthropos. Bingo. Theanthropos is Greek for God-man. Uh, it's an orthodox. Or uh, Eastern Orthodox term. Yeah. So, El Salvador, um, were you here? So you mentioned you weren't here at the, the very beginning. Um, did you hear Cameron talk about his specific argument? He gave three, uh, I, think, I think it was three premises. Uh, 
the first being every natural innate desire in us corresponds to some real object that can satisfy that desire. The next premise is that there exists a desire in us that nothing in time, space, or on earth, um, no creature can satisfy. Therefore, he concludes, there must be something more th than time beyond this earth and more than a creature that exists. Um, and so, I mean, it, it's a valid argument, right? Uh, it's just that some people will have po try and poke holes at some of those specific premises. Um, so I just wanted to fill you in in case you hadn't oh, heard. Thank you. thank you. So, so there is a kind of greater argument going on rather than like, um, rather than just the statement that C.S. Lewis kind of gives at one point, um, you know, if the, if the, if fish had not always, uh, what was it? Uh, you know, if fish did not always felt it that it was weird to be wet, would that not highly um, suggest that the fish had not always been or would not always be a purely aquatic creature. And it, it's really meant to kind of um, kind of draw something out of you, uh, draw your desire for, uh, awaken your desires. Um, and I think, I don't know, there were different thoughts that the Inklings had. And I'm not well-versed enough to kind of go into all the, their, their intellectual thoughts, but there, there's something to this integrated take, I think, on reality. And this is something I'd like to present to this small group here, just, um, I mean, just right now, is that I think that if God really is the one behind reality, then he made all the different personality types. Um, he is vested in a certain sense, uh, he has invested his own image into us as his creation. And I think this is a great intellectually and intellectual starting point for people who want to consider, um, consider not only just strict uh, logic and reason, uh, which is something I love to do, but um, also to take seriously what other people of other personality types and here I'm oh, what what they take seriously and so here i'm referring to actually my favorite the, the myers-briggs personality type and there's four different basic types there's artisans who desire who, who are um really geared toward uh toward happiness and kind of uh living in the present there's guardians who value authority and and justice and there's uh idealists who value identity and rationals who value uh thinking and so um, I think that that God, in his greatness of character, has made um, all four of these personality types pursue something that is real because it's grounded in him. Um, and so here, this is just an idea, but, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of take it with a grain of salt here, but I think that uh, as thinkers, this is really exciting because that means we can, we can think about um, some of these varied concepts, for instance, desires, not only from an intellectual perspective, uh, but from a desire perspective or from a justice perspective, and they can all have a grounding in reality. And I guess that's what I'm saying is, is somewhat unique in the Christian perspective, um, or at least in the theistic perspective, um, is that, that there is someone to ground uh, these pursuits of humanity in a way that a purely atheistic world couldn't. And so this is a separate argument than the one that Cameron was giving, or it's not even an argument. It's just a, it's just kind of a thought project I have going and I'm hoping it leads somewhere, but thanks for letting me share it with you guys. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, well, well, uh, my, my view is that, um, a lot of people clearly know that something is amiss in the world. They know that, you know, they feel pain, you know, they, they feel pain at some point in their life. So then at some level, they know that there's something wrong. And for me, the Christian God is, is a very good explanation for, uh, it reconciles the fact that we do feel pain, but we also see design and structure in the universe like um, the world was constructed by a mind. And so... Um, we, I think the argument from, from from desire is not as complete an argument as I would like that I would present. I would say that each of us knows, each of us feels pain at some point in our life, or we know someone that feels pain, and we just know that that something's amiss. It shouldn't be that way. And I, I think 
the uh, Christian theology has the best explanation for why uh, we experience pain, why we would wish it were not here, and while why also at the same time the universe looks incredibly well designed uh, and uh, created for life, and you know it's it's very difficult to reconcile that something that is. Uh, as brilliant as something that could design life and create it and create the universe could also allow all this pain. And so I think um, our desire to, to not have pain does point to, to something needing resolution, uh, an explanation. Um, C.S. Lewis also said pain is God's megaphone. So, um, uh, you know, pain does create desire for the absence of pain. So uh, that that's kind of kind of my view. I, I think that um, uh, I would just make a variation on the, the argument from desire for God's existence. I would just say that we have a desire uh, we have a desire to understand the reason for pain and why it's there, and that might motivate someone to seek an explanation. Uh, the point about pain is is good. Uh, there's one more thing I'd like to add. It, uh, we not only have a desire to you know escape pain, we also have a desire to know. Don't we all? We do. Uh, we uh, as you know idealists, thinkers, as Daniel said. Now, our you know of now we our desire for you know you know complete knowledge, omniscience, if you will, is possible only if God exists. And if this is the and if this God is the Christian conception of God, the God who you know uh, allows uh, you know created persons to participate in His energies, uh, you know uh, what uh, the uh, Orthodox call theosis and what uh, Catholics call uh, deification. So yes, uh, yes, uh, any. The god of any religion can, you know, uh, can, you know, assuage the pain we have, but only uh, the god of uh, the Christian uh, tradition can, you know, truly make us gods. Um, one thing I wanted to say about uh, Daniel, um, this thing about artistic stuff, um, I really like what you said because uh, uh, I have a very artistic side. And uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, before he became a Christian, uh, said he was just very fascinated by literature because the real world was such a miserable place. And uh, to go into all the myths and all the uh, stories when he was studying um, literature, that kind of got his mind off just the awful condition of the world. And I realized, I said, you know, uh, what he realized, what Lewis realized, was that all those stories were kind of pointing to something better. It, it was this. It, it was highlighting the fact that we did need, we did desire something far better than the way the world is, and uh, that was the beginning of his journey. And so, uh, you know, I I think people who are sensitive to art will realize, you know, there's 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 there has to be more to. Uh, the, you know, the ugly reality of our universe than uh, what there is, you know, art seems to take us, to show us that there's a possibility, at least in principle, of something better. And uh, that was the beginning of C.S. Lewis's journey. So, I mean, I could see where, you know, there's an argument from desire there. I'm just saying that, you know, I would amend it a little more. And especially talking to artists, it's very easy to, to share that with them because, they really feel the contrast in their life all the time. You know, they'll write all these beautiful stories, and yet when they look at the real world, it's just such a miserable place. And yet, to them, what their art has created is something that seems more real than the ugly world. And it's like, I think Lewis realized that's not really, in a sense, those make-believe worlds, those fictions, are, in a sense, they had an essence of something that really was true. Uh, it was it was an imperfect description of what we you know 
uh, of the happily ever after that God has put in every soul. The desire for happily ever after that's put in every soul. Hmm. Uh, since you mentioned uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, you know the uh, uh, you know how C.S. Lewis, you know, uh, through the you know stories he read, you know, through literature, he found the myth, which is also a truth. Uh, myth, which is also truth at the same time. That is the incarnation. Uh, that's you know uh, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, and I agree with you that that you know that's indeed the truth. Uh, take you know all all the pagan cultures of the world, for example. Why were they casting the gods in in the image of man? Why did they approach God as if you know, God gods as if they were men? Uh, when they also uh, knew that these gods were also forces of nature. Is that not? Was that not a deep deep desire for you know for God to approach man for God to you know God to meet man you know uh, this very very deep seated desire for a sacramental union with of man with God so yes and thank Tolkien for converting C.S. Lewis too bad he didn't become Catholic though yeah. But that brings me to one more thing, uh, the uh, argument for the incarnation, which we can go into uh, from the argument uh, from desire. Uh, is everyone okay with me presenting that? I'll be very, very, very short. Yes. Um, give, give us one more sec, if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I mean, sure. I think we'd, we'd all be, I, I'd at least be fine with uh, hearing that. Um, I just wanted think a little bit more about how to apply what we're talking about with regards to art, um, which is a kind of, it's, it's a related topic, I feel like. Um, and I'm just wondering how do we get this kind of, how, how do we get this kind of culture to engage um, when oftentimes even Christians will say, oh, well, that movie is just entertainment. We don't have a concept of our art. Uh, El Salvador, like you might be creating um, as it being something that we need to take seriously. Is there a way, I mean, I guess we could just ask questions, right? We could, um, what else could we do? Any thoughts on like how we could, could well, help people engage the deeper story here, whether it is the incarnation or, or other things? Um, I really don't know, uh, but we have to start by not driving artists out of church. Um, I'm, an, I'm from an evangelical tradition and I've seen the churches um, a lot of churches uh, drive out their artistic talent hmm. um, ah. drive out uh, also their intellectual talent so they're almost left you know, all the, the people that are very gifted end up being thrown out of the church and becoming enemies of the church which hmm. so the first thing to do is to make them feel valuable I was in churches that, uh, uh, when I was struggling with faith, didn't value the fact that I had a skeptical mind. I have a very skeptical mindset. Uh, they didn't appreciate that because I would ask very tough questions about, like, well, why, sh why should anyone believe in God? And I didn't ask that because I was trying to scoff. I was actually asking because I was hoping to get answers. Instead, I got some rough treatment. The other thing is, Sometimes um, uh, the artists, people who are artistic, unless they do something that's kind of preachy and overtly Christian, it's sometimes not, you know, they're not really welcomed in the church. So, uh, for example, if we look at the Chronicles of Narnia, it's not overtly a Christian work, but, uh, you know, uh, I mean, People who are Christians will recognize uh, the Christian themes in it, but they're they're you know it made it a good uh, what made it a good series of uh, in literature was it was just really good literature. The same would go for music or anything else. Um, I think these people have to be welcomed in the church, and if they decide to be in secular entertainment, they shouldn't be thrown out of the church because they're not being preachers, so to speak in their literature. 
So that's the first thing. Um, um, but I, I do, I think, I think there, I, I would love to see more a development in the philosophy of art. Uh, I have, I'm kind of an amateur philosopher of art and uh, I have opinions about um, uh, what constant, you know, why we were attracted to certain things in art, uh, particularly music. Uh, for example, I'm of the opinion that we're actually very wired to appreciate certain kinds of sounds and we are revolted by others and I don't think that's an accident. That uh, there's a reason that when Western music uh, starts to be uh, heard in Eastern lands that it, it takes hold um, because because there, there's something that's very innate that says this is beautiful. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, me being from the uh, from Asia, I'm, I'm always amused to hear stories of how the Asians just love classical music. And I don't think that that's... Uh, Maybe. Yeah, see, that's, I don't think that's an accident. No. It's not. Um, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. And so, uh, uh, the people that... Uh, love beautiful things and they can conceptualize it if they're idealists um, uh, they're able to see that you know why does that not really jive with the way the rest of the world is and um, that can at least uh, I mean to me it says there has to be a more to existence than just the ugliness of the world and regarding uh, Tom McGee mentioned Pascal's wager if you know I would uh, I would like to at least hope that there's something more. Um, it's not proof, but it's certainly proof that we, for some people, that we want more. And I think we can leverage that. The other thing that I've been really hoping for those who are creationists or interested in bibli biblical archaeology, there's a great opportunity to, to make really good Hollywood movies and dramas. And um, I, I you know, I've talked to some Hollywood scriptwriters and all, and I've been trying to, to say, you know, focus on this. It's going to be popular stuff if you do it really, really well. Hmm. So, how about I go into the argument I formulated for why the incarnation had to take place? Am I audible? What's that? Okay, so how about I go into the argument I have formulated for why the incarnation had to take place? Um, I just want to say, I thanks, uh, El Salvador. Um, yeah, I man, I it takes me a while to formulate ideas, um, but uh, you know, let me know if you end up uh, writing something on that topic. I just would be interested if you don't mind. Maybe I can, I don't know how I can message you, but uh, <laughs> maybe find you in some way. Uh, I'm probably in your area. I'm in the SoCal area, so um, if you're in Hollywood. Uh, no, I'm in, I'm in Woodbridge, Virginia, which is on the other side, but there've been Hollywood script writers that come out here to the East Coast um, uh, who became Christians, and uh, you know, the, there, there's there's an opportunity for for great stuff to be uh, to be moved forward in the culture. So, um, uh, I, I'm glad you're showing some interest. I, I'm really hoping that I can get more artists interested. Uh, there, there's really a just a wonderful opportunity to uh, um, change, to, to affect the culture. Totally, I agree. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, are, are, you, uh, are you a writer or? Uh, yeah, I, I wish I was a writer, but I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm totally the opposite. It takes me forever to write anything. It has to be exactly precise and it is super frustrating because I have so many ideas and I'm like, I can't contain them. Anyhow, but uh Hopefully, maybe uh, maybe someday I can learn some sort of artistic expression and try and uh, communicate those higher dimensions that I, I feel unable to articulate in a linear writing. <laughs> um, uh, 
Uh, oh, by the way, as far as the incarnation, I don't have any, I don't really have any thoughts about how to, uh, you know, how the, how to argue that the, the logos had to, to come in. So I don't really have any thoughts. I just, you know, I just accept it as a matter of what I learned from the Bible. Uh -huh. Yes, I get that. You know, uh, with me, um, you know, I came to, you know, right belief. <laughs> well, yeah, Christianity, orthodoxy through, you know, uh, almost exclusively through philosophy. Like, uh, it was through philosophy that I had to, you know, I came to the conclusion that, yes, God is triune and, you know, and then, yes, this uh, argument I formulated for the incarnation. Because it was through philosophy that all the objections I had against Christianity were, you know, were, you know, one by one, just blown out of the water. Thanks, St. Thomas, for that. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Uh, so here's how I go about, you know, arguing for the incarnation. So from, uh, so this argument from desire, we see two things from this. One is that, you know, our very being, our, you know, Everything about us is, you know, directed towards God. Because, you know, what we desire, as I said, what we desire is the fullness of being. That's what, in whatever we uh, desire, whatever, what, whatever other thing we desire, ultimately what we desire is fullness of being. And, you know, uh, you know uh, our desire is not towards this being or that being, this good or that good, but goodness itself as a universal. So, yes. Uh, so everything about us is oriented towards God. But what we also have seen from this uh, argument is that, well, why exactly are we you know, using this argument? We're using this, uh, this, this whole exercise is, is an attempt to, well, it is a very good attempt, even successfully once you went into, you know, Aristotelian metaphysics. It's, it's an, a, you know, it's, uh, it's a proof of the existence of God. Uh, but here's the thing, we don't have, you know, an innate, you know, self-evident, you know, a knowledge of God. It, it's not, uh, well, we don't uh, see that God exists is a truth, is necessary truth in the, in the same way that uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 is necessarily true. Well, it is necessarily true, it is logically necessary that God exists, but you have to go through the entire cosmological argument or well, teleological argument or the argument from desire for that. So what we see is that when we have this, uh, our entire being is oriented towards God, one, but two, we really uh, have no, you know, direct contact with God at all. And human intelligence is such that, you know, human nature is such that we know being only through the lowest kind of being, corporeal being, bodies, matter. That's the only kind of being whose existence we, you know, we directly perceive. Uh, it is from the fact that, you know, bodies exist, but they are contingent. But, you know, con contingent things require cause. That's how we proceed to the fact that, yes, God exists. In other words, uh, we never really experience God. Well, mystics uh, accepted, of course. But, you know, the rest of us, ordinary mortals, uh, we have only a very... This, uh, you know, we don't have a direct uh, knowledge of God, but uh, our entire being is oriented towards this direct knowledge of God because the experience of God can only be an intellectual experience. We can only experience God through the intellect, not through, you know, our senses because God is not a material object. God is, you know, entirely spiritual. So, you know, God is intellection. So uh, if God can be experienced, he can only be experienced through our intellect. But here's the, you know, uh, the uh, problem with it. Our intellect cannot perceive God at all, not directly. So how exactly do we attain our goal? First thing we learn from this is that we cannot, well, but, uh, we cannot proceed to God by our own. Nothing that we do can, you know, uh, can, you know, take us to God. But by Pelagius, that heresy is gone now. Yes. So, well, the only way we can attain the fulfillment of our existence is by grace. Yes? The thing is, uh, you know, God is, the experience of God requires, you know, the experience of anything requires a receptive, 
a receptivity to that thing. If I want to experience color, I have to open my eyes. If I want to listen to Western music, especially uh, the, the uh, divine liturgy or the Orthodox divine liturgy in Russian, I love that. If I want to listen to that, you know, I must open myself to what uh, I need to pers- uh, you know, I, what I need to perceive. But the thing about you know our uh, uh, you know our the thing uh, so opening uh, opening up uh, ourselves to this experience of God is a, a matter of the will because uh, I get I suppose that's clear we we need to you know bring our will to complete submission to complete you know receptivity to the experience of God yes. That is, if God is to, you know, give us the uh, beatific vision, his, you know, the direct experience of God through grace, we need to, you know, uh, we need to, you know, stop resisting it. The, th- uh, the thing about this is that, although we know intellectually that, yes, God is the on big good, it is only through God that I can find the, I can achieve what I, uh, what I, you know, see. It's only in God that my heart can rest, as Saint Augustine said. The thing is, because we are, uh, you know, we our ordinary apprehension of being is through, you know, limited contingent beings, and our experience of good, good things is, you know, is basically contingent good. Uh, and since our, uh, you know, our uh, the our uh, our knowledge of God is simply one that is based on. You know, it's simply something you arrive at by logic. We don't have this, uh, you know, desire to. We don't have this. This. It's not like we have this burning desire to. You know, yes, I should have the experience of God right now. We don't have that. We're not like on fire for God. Well, mystics accepted, of course. The rest of us, uh, and the rest. Well, since we all sin, and sin is where you know our will is divorced from the intellect. We, uh, that happens to us a lot, and the thing, uh, the thing about our will is, our will is, uh, it's what the, uh, it's, it's what the father has called the gnomic will. It's, it's a will which is, it's, it's never steady. It's always, you know, vacillating from one contingent good to the other, and uh, it, it vacillates in this way because no, no contingent good can, you know, ful- fulfill the thirst of the will. So the will is, uh, you know, by our very uh, uh, mode of existence as creatures are will uh, we experience only contingent goods directly that is through our natural powers and because of that we can experience even if God were to you know reveal himself to us we would not be able to experience him because uh, we uh, our will would come, uh, you know would be vacillating all the time it you know uh, it's like uh, you know for, uh, our will would have to be in you know stillness you know uh, what uh, the uh, Eastern Fathers called Hezekiah, silence, uh, or Saint John of the Cross, uh, what he spoke of, you know, divine silence. That's when you, uh, you know, you seek the, um, you seek the voice of God. And the thing is, we don't naturally desire the stillness. We always, uh, the, uh, the human will always vacillate, and it wants to vacillate. Yes. So uh, what the will, uh, what we know that we should be still, but we are unable to do so. So here we have a problem. The very thing that we need cannot is is not in us. So God should not only provide us, you know, uh, it should not only provide us, you know, uh, his direct experience. He should also, you know, change our will. He should, you know, work. Uh, from within to, you know, you know, to put an end to this vacillation of our will to bring us into Hezekiah to divine silence. Uh, of course, uh, he cannot do so uh, if he, uh, for one thing, he cannot directly do so because, again, because because our will is vacillating. Uh, even if God were to act on us, we would not be able to receive it. The only way he could, in fact, uh, change our will is by acting against it. But that would, uh, that's not what, uh, but if we accept that God wants us to accept him freely, he cannot do that. So God himself is faced with a dilemma. 
he desires to you know give share his goodness with humans but humans and even trust me uh, even angels uh, humans and angels by their own natural facilities faculties uh, they are unable to you know get into that state of stillness to experience him and if he wants to you know still their wills uh, he can only do so that is better by direct action by acting against that will so what is the solution there must be something which bridges the divine goodness and the human will and that can only be a human will which is completely you know still which is which is uh completely you know uh, you know which is filled with the light of god so and it is through this human will that you know the rest of the human race can experience god but if god were to uh, create such a person or you know a separate human person with such a will god could uh, god wouldn't be able to you know uh wouldn't be uh, he would be able to you know bring that will to his to silence so what is the solution the only thing he can do is take that will and you know make it uh you know link it to himself that is that human will is not to be a different person but should be the same as himself it is only that way that this will can be the perfect uh, vessel for you know the light of god to flow into human mind and that's why the incarnation had to occur and as can be well uh, guessed as as you can see uh, this reason why there had to be a human will you know to uh, which is, which would be in, uh, which would be you know connected to the divine will uh, hypostatically uh, not only does it show that uh, you know well uh, yes so not only is this an argument for the incarnation it's also an argument for a very specific christology the christology of the orthodox and catholic churches that's the diatheletism god has well uh, christ has uh, not only does it does he have two uh, not only does he have two natures he also has two wills he has a divine will and a human will diatheletism uh, that's what it's called uh, so yeah that's the argument uh, as that sentence i could make it the thing is uh, i said that this is also how uh, you know what about the angels you might ask uh, i don't know but mm, if we look into the psalms we see that uh, the manna which god dropped from heaven is called the food of the angels psalm 78 i think i could be wrong uh, he fed to man the food of the angels something like that uh, so yeah even angels had to you know attain to this uh, experience of god by by grace yeah that's about it as such center that could make it any objections um well that's uh that's nothing that i i i delve into i just uh, i i just except the incarnation and and grateful for it um i tend to look more uh in the old testament uh, mm-hmm. uh that that shows the scriptures pointing to 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 Jesus Christ and um that's kind of more of where my focus is for the incarnation I need to get hearing so anyone else want to add any further last comments before we call it a day um i just i really i really wanted to thank you for hosting this channel thing uh, yeah thanks um it may sound funny but i thought i really wouldn't get a lot out of the Aaron Roth thing last week but i i got a lot from it because I, uh, I deal with a lot of uh, with people who are on the fence that are 
confronted with the same questions and and it's good practice for me to at least think through how I would deal with some of the, the things that Aaron Ra brought up. I mean, when he started talking about the, uh, when he mentioned the talking snake and the talking donkey, I said, you know, that's a really good injection. You know, I, how am I going to answer that when, when Christians were you think facing that's a good death? Objection? You thought that was a good objection? I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I, I hadn't listened to that. I came late. What was the objection exactly? The, the talking dog objection? There wasn't a formidable objection at all. Oh, well, what was it then? Oh, Aaron Ra is an atheist. He spoke last week. And, uh -huh. well, what evidence do you have that a, that a donkey talk or that a snake can talk? Do you really believe that? You know, why, why, should I, why should I believe that? And I thought that was a really good, um, that's a really good thing for a Christian who's trying to defend the faith to be able to answer. I'm not going to say whether it was a good objection or not. It's a good question. I think it's a question that a Christian who, uh, particularly an apologist, should be capable of giving a credible answer for. And so the answer I came up with is, there's no proof, direct proof of that. The only way that I can accept that it's true is if there's another miracle that I think there's credible evidence for. And if I have credible evidence for that miracle, um, then I can believe in other miracles. And if, an account, if there's an account in the Bible that um, I can't directly verify, I'm willing to believe the other parts of the Bible if there are parts that I can verify like the resurrection of Christ, so or the origin of you know the miraculous origin of life, then it becomes possible to believe these other things that we don't have direct access to in terms of the truth. So that's my answer to Aaron Rob. But I really had to think about it. I said, I can imagine that there are Christians out there that are wrestling with those questions. I certainly have. So uh, I just wanted to to thank Jonathan. I know that. Uh, uh, you know, some people are pretty upset with Aaron Roth, and I'm like, I really am glad to have someone that's first rate. Maybe this side, I would challenge this. Wow. I, I enjoy the debate. I, I wouldn't call Aaron Roth first rate, personally. I don't think he's that great, to be honest. But, um, Wait, excuse me, that was your objection? That was your objection. That was your objection by this, uh, yeah, I've heard of Aaron Ra. That was his objection? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm not dismissive of, dismissive of it because there are a lot of ordinary people that that's the reaction they would have. It doesn't have to be an intellectual argument, but I can tell you that when I was sharing the sharing, uh, the gospel on campus, I mentioned Adam and Eve, and people just turned away. They just walked out of the room. They said, man, you just lost all your credibility. I said, okay, that's just the way it is, you know. Uh, just have to deal with it. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll stop to right. Well, next week we have uh, Dr. Michael Brown coming on to talk to us about messianic prophecy. Let's see if I get it in there, inshallah. No, I don't have anything else. Uh, what time is the uh, Bible study, Jonathan? I haven't been able to come out to it yet. But... It's at um, 9 p.m. UK time tomorrow, which is 4 p.m. Eastern or 3 p.m. Central or 1 p.m. Pacific. Okay. I, I might try to come out. So I really thank you for doing this. It's really great training for me. You're welcome. And, uh, I'm happy with us. Are you coming to the United States in time? I don't have plans currently, but um, maybe, maybe sometime. But um, if I do come, I will see you there. Um, just one administrative thing. Uh, we talked about Dr. Sanford's genetic entropy possibly being presented in uh, one of these Saturday sessions. Um, I can tell you that he probably doesn't have the personality that would fit well with this format, but he has two assistants that can help. Uh, Chris Roop and myself work for his foundation. And Chris Roop is doing a lot of the, a lot of the uh, genomic research, and then I'm at the NIH also doing research on the topic. So, 
I know you have a lot of really good people. I don't know that we would qualify, but we're willing to offer what we know. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So, um, um, I guess I'll see you guys. If you want to join the Bible study, we're on tomorrow night um, at 9 p.m. UK time. Um, or um, uh, Jonathan, one question, uh, question, if you will. Uh, there was this uh, supposed uh, you know, session about uh, with someone named Blake, Blake Jim Is that how his name is pronounced? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the uh, cosmological argument. What happened to that? Uh, well, I wanted to attend to that. It, um, we, I, uh, Blake um, volunteered to reschedule his so that we could put in Matt Dillahunty. I haven't yet fixed another date for him. So what? I said Blake volunteered to reschedule his one so we could fit in Matt Dillahunty. So I have still to reschedule. Ah, that guy. Hmm. That reminds me. We have a session with his wife, no? Yes, we do. Now that's one session I'm definitely going to attend. Dear Svold. Um, can I talk to uh, Sri? Because I know you probably want to sign off the other guys. I just wanted to ask Sri some questions. Okay, I will, sure. um, I will make um, uh, Salvador, I'm going to make you the host. And then I'm going to log off. Okay, God bless you. You, you are nice. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, Good God night. bless you, Jonathan. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm supposedly the host, and <laughs> got to press anything? Nope. I guess not. <laughs>